Okay, we're now recording, Tim. Okay, and I'll be stopping every two or three slides for questions to uh, just the way I've got it organized. There's some good natural breaks in here. Uh, so, uh, of course, libraries are very committed to working together. Um, there's a strong belief within the library community that we're stronger when we work together, uh, when we share knowledge, when we share expertise, when we pool resources, when we help one another out. And so it's not surprising that libraries are involved in many consortia and organizations. Uh, and I will say, although it may seem intuitively obvious to us that it's better to cooperate and work with our friends and colleagues. I mean, that's not really how most industries work. I mean, it's not like Harris Teeter and Lowe's and Food Lion all you know, share staff and personnel and ideas about how to deal with their grocery stores, right? So libraries are, in academia in general, I think is, is you know, a pretty cooperative enterprise. Libraries more so than campuses in general, I think, and I think that would be more true as we start, you know, competing for fewer students um, with demography being the way it is. I think it'll higher education will probably become slightly more cutthroat. What we've got here is a screenshot of uh, a list of the initiatives, consortias, and partnerships uh, that UNCG is involved in. Uh, it's on our website. Uh, if anyone wants to suggest additional ones let me know uh, there are many fine organizations that we work with some are hyper local like tala the triangle area library association some are international like oclc some are really defined and single purpose like um, the acrl diversity alliance some are huge umbrella organizations like ala um, there's all kinds of organizations out there that do all kinds of different things. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to try to focus on a particular segment of them uh, that is the e-resource organizations that UNCG works with primarily and gets resources from on a regular basis. There are some other regionals that we work with, uh, like ACERL, for example. We got a lot of Adam Matthew content from them last year but we don't usually get anything from them in a given year. So here are the four that we work with every year and get significant resources from, and they're organized from smallest geographic scope, a UNC system only, it's the first one. The next one is North Carolina. The next one is North Carolina and South Carolina, and then Lyricist is regional, but going on international. And I want to tell you a little bit more about these organizations, you know, what they do, how they're set up, um, how their governance structure is, um, and how UNCG people are involved in these organizations and what resources we get from them. And the first three, I've been in leadership positions on for many years, so I have some inside scoop. And so I'll try to spice it up a little bit and give you a little insight into how these organizations work and, you know, what they do well and what could frankly be done a lot better, right? Because there's always room for improvement in any organization, no matter how good you think you are. So ULAC, this is the University Library Librarians Advisory Council. It's made up of the dean or director from each of the 17 constituent UNC institutions. And I'm on there as an ex officio member. And this group gets together twice a month, talk about various issues. They don't have any money. They don't have any staff. It's just, you know, each person represents their library and they look for a commonality of interest. And that's different from a lot of other state systems. Um, I guess the biggest contrast would be with the UC system, University of California. Uh, those 10 schools have a centralized staff of 80 people. That's as many people as we have in our entire library. That's how many people they have working in their central office to support the entire system. They also have staffs at each one of their 10 libraries. Right? So they have a lot of money and a lot of staff centrally that their directors and deans, their version of ULAC is to decide how to allocate that. Our system doesn't have anything like that. And largely because of that, when you like gets together and talks about things they could do, um, when somebody comes up with a good idea and something people want to do, 
there's then a kind of a round robin. Well, who's actually going to do it? Who's got the money? Who's got the time? Who's got the resources to commit to this particular good idea? So everything is an opt-in. So if we've got something on the table, it's not, we're not going to do it for the system. We're not going to take a vote and, you know, if 13 of the 17 vote yes, then all 17 do it. If 13 want to do it, then 13 will do it and the other four won't. So it's opt-in and not all in the way something like the UC system is. So in terms of uh, UNC G in involvement in that, um, Mike is obviously uh, our official uh, dean director person who's, who's on ULAC. Uh, I attend all of the ULAC meetings. I chair the efficiencies group that does joint purchasing of e-resources. Um, there are other people on other groups um, Christine, OER, Anna's on a, no, Christine's on efficiencies, textbook efficiencies, and classroom efficiencies, and Anna's on OER, and Mike's on a personnel group, I think Sean's on that, Terry's on an ILS group, so there's, there's various folks from UNCG involved in various committees, but on the, the committee that deals with e-resources, which is the collaborative efficiency script, getting these resources together. I am the chair of that. And the deals that we're doing are all EBS ebook deals. And I'll talk, I'll give a, a description of how that works um, and kind of tie it into why we're doing deals as a group in ULAC. So a few years ago, um, the UC system decided they didn't want to work with Elsevier. They, they have now gotten back with Elsevier and made up, uh, but they weren't, didn't want to work with Elsevier. And there were some folks in the UNC system, some deans and directors that said, we should be more like the UC system, you know, ignoring the fact they've got 80 full-time central employees and millions of dollars in central funding, but we should be like that and do all this stuff together, which clearly we weren't set up to do, which, you know, so that obviously wasn't going to work. And I suggested, well, if we want to start doing stuff together, you know, you don't start by picking a fight with the biggest, toughest guy in the bar, Elsevier. You know, if we want to do stuff together, we should start with the trust building exercise and start with something smaller and more digestible, uh, like an ebook deal. And I was a big fan of these ebook deals and been trying to get a group to do them. And it seemed like a moment of opportunity where the, I was talking to a bunch of people who were saying, we should do things as a group. And I had something I thought would work really well as a group, as a group deal. And here's the way it works. So Wiley eBooks. So all the schools in the system were buying some Wiley eBooks. Maybe UNC Asheville was buying 10 a year and Chapel Hill was buying 1,000 a year and NC State was buying 1,500 a year. Everybody was spending some money to buy some books. So I figured out how much money everybody was already spending. So it took the amount they were already spending. So it doesn't cost any more. And instead of UNCA getting 10 books and UNC getting a thousand, we all get access to all of Wiley's books. So we all get access to all of Wiley's 23,000 books, every school in the system from the largest to the smallest. It's a level playing field. It doesn't matter if it's you know, a historically underfunded HBCU or if it's a flagship school, everybody gets the same thing. Um, so that's appealing. And at the end of each year, so we have access to all the books, 23,000 books for a year. And then at the end of the year, we can use that pooled money to buy books for the whole system. And we're buying about 1,100 books a year based on the ones that are used the most. And that's why it's evidence-based. We're buying the books that are used the most. And nobody was buying 1100 individually. So collectively, we're buying more for everyone than they could have bought on their own. So it's just leveraging money we were already spending to get so much more for our students and faculty. Uh, so that was a big success. And so we did Oxford and Taylor and Francis. And the reason we ended up with this mix partly too is that I did a study of assigned readings across the UNC system to see which publishers' books were assigned the most and reason that if we get EBS deals with those folks and we're getting all their books, then when a faculty member assigns one of their books, we'll already have it and the students won't have to buy it and we'll save a lot of money for students and reduce the cost of college education, which is a great thing in and of itself and also plays well to the system office. 
Um, so that's why we're doing EBS deals. And those are the three that we're doing as a system. And I'm the one that negotiated all those deals. So some kind of interesting perspectives on ULAC. Um, I've been involved in them for many years. Uh, one thing that's interesting is the role of the flagship. Usually in a state system, there is one school that you know is the flagship school, and they're the ones that usually negotiate all the deals and do a lot of the work for the group, and it's kind of expected. And North Carolina is an outlier. We're not that way. Uh, UNC is the flagship. They have never spent a lot of time working with the other schools in the system. That's not a condemnation. Um, they decided early on that they had more in common with NC State and Duke than they did with the other, you know, with Wilmington or Greensboro or Asheville. Um, and maybe that's true. You know, those are three ARLs. They're all very close to each other. And so they made their own club, TRLN, um, and the rest of us weren't invited to participate or allowed to participate in that. So they put their resources into that. Um, TRLN is not very active anymore, but the relatively new dean, actually not that new, she's probably been here four or five years, but Elaine Westbrook uh, is a very strong individual who wants to do her own thing and she doesn't want necessarily to do things with other people. She wants to do her own thing for her own school. And so UNC is still not interested in doing things with other schools very much. So, it, and that's unusual. I and mean, that's not the way it is in you know, Texas. CT Austin does a lot of the things for everybody. And uh, South Carolina, uh, USC Columbia does a lot of things for the state, but that's just not the way we're set up, which is unusual. We've also got a lot of tension between, I'd say, individual autonomy and making decisions within ULAC and doing things for the collective good. Because it's easy to say we should all get together and buy this, I don't know, science database. But does the School of the Arts want to do that? I mean, you know, <laughs> it's not really their thing. So maybe they want to opt out. And so at times, the deans want to do things together because they know it's more efficient and better. And so the concept is good, but when it comes to a specific initiative, there's always somebody who thinks, well, I'm not as interested in that as everybody else, so I don't wanna do it. And because we have this opt-in, opt-out process, people can opt out and we end up doing very little as a system. And that's partly because we're not like the UC system. The UC systems tend very large libraries that are very similar, and we're not that way. We've got two ARLs, we've got several R2s, we've got some that are basically teaching colleges, even though they're called universities. And we have a high school. North Carolina School of Science and Math is part of the UNC system. It's a high school. So it's great to say we should all have exactly the same things, but do we really need the same things for a high school and for Chapel Hill? Yeah, probably not, you know, so that makes things a little difficult. Um, but that tension keeps coming up because, well, for lots of reasons, <laughs> it does seem like a good idea to do more stuff together. But we also have turnover and we have people who come in as deans who are from places like Ohio or Texas or California. And they say, oh, my God, you guys don't really work together the way the other states do. Why don't you? And, and don't tell me it doesn't work. I came from California and I know it works better to work together. So you guys need to start working together. So the question keeps getting called as we have turnover, we should do more and we have aspirations to do more, but then when something seems pretty good for the group, somebody who doesn't really wanna do it for themselves opts out and we still don't have um, cohesion. And it frankly doesn't help that UNC is probably the least interested in doing things with the group when most people think they should be the most. And as long as you've got opt out, opt in, it's particularly difficult to get critical mass on anything if you've got a small group. We've only got 17 schools to begin with. I mean, this isn't like the Carolina Consortium or um, NC Live. It's got a couple of hundred schools. So when you've got a significant number not doing something, you may not have enough to have an actual group. And in terms of doing e-resources, you know, the three deals that we're doing are really good. I think the appetite's kind of gone for doing more e-resources right now. 
And right now the attention of ULAC is turned towards doing a shared ILS uh, and doing a migration. Um, you know, Chapel Hill's not interested, of course. NC State's not very interested. Um, we're not very interested. Um, I like supporting consortial things. I'm not planning to subject us to a system migration while we're doing a renovation. I think that would be a terrible idea. Um, so I, I do not support doing that. Um, but there are schools that want to do a shared ILS and they're working towards that. If they do a shared ILS, it may involve, they're trying to get money from the system office. I shouldn't say they, because I'm on the group too. I'm, I'm on most of the groups that do collegial shared things within the UNC system, because um, it's kind of my thing. But if it's successful, the system office would provide some staff that would be for the system and for ULAC and some central funding. And once we have that, we have a mechanism in place where we could actually start thinking of ourselves more like the UC system. We're not gonna have 80 people, right, working for us like the UC system does. But if we have anybody, then we can start thinking differently and prioritizing things differently because then we have resources that truly serve everybody and that need to be used for all in things instead of these opt-in things. So there's a potential for the for ULAC to change in the future, but in the short term, I don't think we're going to be doing too many e-resource deals through them. Any questions so far? And that LibGuides link down there uh, has a list of, of things that are going on in ULAC and members. And as you see, it is hosted at ECU because ULAC doesn't have a server or staff or anything. So they're dependent on people like me or, or Joseph or, or Jan over at ECU to, to do things for them. All right, so the next one I want to talk about is NC Live. And it was established in 1997. Um, and the idea here was to get a core group of resources that would serve libraries of many types across the whole state and create a kind of level playing field. So we could say that everybody's getting access to the same core resources. And that when students go from a community college to a university and then graduate and go to their public library, throughout, they will have access to NC Live, so they will still have this core set of resources that they know how to use and are familiar with. Great concept, um, wonderful idea, and it was set up initially with four communities of interest, or COIs, and everything at NC Live is wrapped around these COIs and this way this is organized. So, and they are the community colleges, the public libraries, there's 36 community colleges, I don't know how many public libraries, 80 or so, North Carolina independent colleges and universities, the private schools, it's about 30 of those, and then the UNC system, the 17. And when this was set up, we needed some money, right? So we're going to hire central staff, and we're going to have a central pool of millions of dollars that we're going to use to buy resources for everybody. So he went to the legislature and the community colleges, the public libraries and the UNC system, they're all publicly funded. They told the legislature, you're gonna give us new money this year. We're in line for new money. We know we are because you know our lobbyists have worked with you and we know we're gonna get some funding. Instead of giving us all that funding, take a big chunk of it and give it to NC Live. So cut our increase for the community colleges the public libraries and the UNC system and instead give that money permanently. So not one time money, but our permanent increase, give it to NC Live because we believe in this organization and we're gonna make it work. So that's where the core funding came from for NC Live. We kind of donated it in a way, it's money we would have gotten and we declined and rerouted it. The NC ICU schools uh, obviously don't get money directly from the legislature or not in the same way, at least they do get a little um, but they didn't have that option, so they actually get a bill. So whatever they're going to get a percentage of whatever the cost is of operating NC Live as a bill that goes to each individual library and they pay for it. We don't get a bill, but we kind of paid for it back when it got set up. So the, the total budget's $2.6 um, They have six full-time staff. Um, obviously, they've got infrastructure. 
leaves about 1.9 million for the shared resources. Uh, it is housed at NC State. The employees of NC Live are technically NC State employees that report to Greg Rashke uh, over at NC State as the dean right now. In terms of opportunities for folks to participate, if you're interested in this, there are committees, which I'll address on the next page. There's an annual meeting that's coming up in May. They have listservs. Um, there are training opportunities that they do, and they're looking for people to be ambassadors to spread the good word about NC Live to libraries that are they feel are underutilizing the service. In terms of how it's run, all right, so there's a governance committee. So remember, everything is focused around these four COIs. So I think you know how the governance committee works, right? There's one person from each COI. So that's the governance committee. Then there's four committees. And guess what? Each one is chaired by a different COI. And each one has equal representation from each COI, three people from each. So the one that we currently chair, the UNC system, is the training advisory committee. So right, it's either training or outreach promotions, one of those two. And it's uh, a lady out of uh, UNC, Chapel Hill, chairs that one. Uh, the only person from UNCG who is currently serving on any of these committees is Danny. He's on the website committee. Uh, the committee that everyone feels is the plum assignment that really makes the decisions, you know, make the most important one is the resource advisory committee. And that's currently chaired by the community colleges. And they decide how we're going to spend that 1.9 million. And we're supposed to every three years, you know, take a fresh look at all the resources that we have, get price tags, get a list of things we want to do for the system or for the system for the whole state. And RAC is supposed to make a recommendation every three years. And the current cycle is 2021 to 2023. And the reason I say supposed to is that a couple of cycles ago, the executive director convinced people to do our largest price tag on a six year cycle. So we're not really looking at the 1.9 million every three years, even though that was what we had agreed to. So one of the interesting things about NC Live, and I really like this because I like consensus decision making, is that they don't take votes. So the Resource Advisory Committee has 12 people on it, you know, three people each from the four COIs, and they don't have a vote of 10 to 2 on what to do. They keep talking till everybody, till they get to something everybody can live with. So, and I, and I appreciate that. That's a good way to make decisions, I think. So that's how the resource decisions are made and they're all in. So, you know, if they're purchasing something for the membership, they're purchasing it for small rural public libraries. They're purchasing it for Chapel Hill, um, for community colleges and for everything in between. So NC Live was an EBSCO shop for the longest time. Uh, that was primarily, most of their resources were EBSCO things. And everybody was, uh, you know, loved EBSCO and it trained people in EBSCO. We had EBSCO, EBSCO, EBSCO for like 15 years. But the amount of money we had to spend, the 1.9 million in the pool never went up. And the EBSCO price kept going up and up and up and squeezing everything else out. And about 10 years ago, ProQuest decided to give us a hell of a deal. I mean, I think they were just trying to undercut EBSCO, I think, but I can't prove that or anything. Um, and they gave us a great deal, and we decided to move to ProQuest, which really pissed off a lot of people in NC Live who you know, thought we were going to be EBSCO forever and caused a lot of dissension and difficulty. And I'll own that I was part of the decision to change, but it just looked like you know, if we stuck with EBSCO, it would be problematic uh, in a very short uh, period of time. It particularly annoyed the public libraries um, who felt that, you know, it's one thing for UNCG to give up EBSCO from NC Live because we could then afford to pick it up on our own, but they can't. So they're the ones that got screwed from their point of view. And I mean, I can see that, you know, 
we can't afford to pick up things that NC Live drops, and a lot of people can't. Uh, some small libraries, they literally do not have a databases link on their page like we do. They have an NC Live link because NC Live is their databases. That's all they have, and they're completely dependent on them. So when the mix changes, their entire resource set changes. So NC Live is heavily ProQuest. Uh, there are a few other things on here. Um, you know, those things are also included in our database pages. There's no direct cost to us, but again, we did help get NC Live started by contributing funding in a way. In terms of the future, uh, with the resources in NC Live, um, there's a possibility of adding new communities of interest. We've got these four. Uh, the question that keeps getting asked repeatedly, and rightly so, is why aren't the K-12s at the table? Why don't we have DPI, the Department of Public Instruction? I don't know what the deal is. It sounds like there was some bad blood like 30 years ago and nobody seems to be able to get over it or something. And we've tried to work with them and we've had facilitators, you know, with NC Live and DPI and try to figure out a way, but they're continuing to operate their own smaller service, uh, NC Wise Owl. Um, I don't know if they'll ever join. It'd probably be beneficial to everybody if they did. Um, opt-in deals, um, they tried to do some opt-in deals over time. Of course, the Carolina Consortium does a lot of that. So I'm not sure that they really want to move into that area in an aggressive way. Um, There's some serious issues in their leadership right now. Um, without going into detail, since this is being recorded, I'll just say that their executive director made a bunch of really, really terrible decisions that negatively impacted his membership, his leadership, um, Carolina Consortium, Public Library Directors Association, many people were very unhappy. And at the last uh, NC Live meeting, that leadership group of four I told you about, they read a public letter of apology to the Carolina Consortium and others um, because of his conduct uh, of the executive director of NC Live. So, um, I don't know. So there's some issues there and maybe he'll move on somewhere else. Um, so we've got new resource selection coming up. So that's an opportunity for change in the resource mix that uh, NC Live provides. But again, most of the money is already tied up in a six year deal with ProQuest. And one of the things that just makes NC Live really difficult in terms of the resource selection is that whatever RAC comes up with has to be kind of least common denominator. They have to have something that nobody's gonna filibuster because that's the way it works, right? It's all by consensus. So you gotta have something that the public libraries are okay with and the academics are okay with. Um, and it's, it's hard to find things like that. So there's a lot of horse trading going on there. So it's hard to know exactly what will happen with NC Live next. I do feel like they're in a bit of an inflection point as is the Carolina Consortium, as we'll, we'll talk about in just a moment. So any questions about NC Live? Well, I've been very clear, I guess, or <laughs> y'all are tired, I don't know. So Carolina Consortium, so I founded this in 2004 um, in this kind of you know, relates back to my earlier narrative. And in, in most states, the uh, flagship university would be doing a Carolina Consortium thing. If it needed doing, it would be done by Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill was in some awesome deals that we were not allowed to join. Um, you know, I asked to join TRLN deals and they said, nope. Um, and we could not do these things on our own because these deals were not available to you unless your total spend was, it depended on the deal, but let's say like $3 million. And we, we didn't have three, our entire collections budget was $3 million. We didn't have $3 million for one deal, right? So I would have to combine with 30 or 40 other libraries in order to get a deal. TRLN already had 3 million, so they could have let us join. It wouldn't hurt them at all, but they weren't gonna do that. So it was very frustrating. And there were a lot of people in the state that were very frustrated by the situation that a school that we thought should be helping us out had other priorities. 
So everybody bitched about it, um, and rightfully so. And I decided I would try to do something about it. So I got on the phone and started calling people. And at the time, nobody knew me. So it was a bunch of cold calls, which was not my favorite thing. A lot of people thought I was like a vendor or salesperson or something. I was just calling up other universities in North Carolina, South Carolina, saying, hey, I think we should try to work together to build something um, that's you know better, that works uh, for all of us. And you shouldn't have to pay any more than you're paying now, but you'll get so much more. And uh, to my great delight, we did get about 40 schools in that first year, um, working on three different deals, Wiley, Blackwell, and Springer. And within three or four years, that had grown to 120 schools working on, uh, you know, getting like 40 deals. So it just took off really fast. Um, we're up to working with like nearly 50 different publishers or vendors, you know, NC Live only works with about four. So we work with, with many more, um, you know, we're multi-state, uh, our return on investment for every dollar spent on Carolina Consortium deals, uh, the libraries get $14 worth of content. And the total cost of avoidance there is $420 million a year spread across the entire membership, of course, and more than half a million students attend universities, colleges, public libraries, community colleges, chiropractic colleges, seminary schools, and other institutions that are uh, enjoying content through the Carolina Consortium. So uh, there are the core negotiating team are all uh, UNCG folks, it's a very UNCG centric organization for better and for worse sometimes. Um, and we have shouldered a disproportionate share, obviously, since we're doing 99% of the work, um, but we get more out of it than we put into it. So it's, it's okay for now, at least. Uh, and in many ways, Carolina Consortium is the opposite of NC Live and the way it's set up and organized. And the NC Live is all all in deals. They're doing things for everybody and they're spending a central pool and they have central staff that, that are paid. And we're the opposite. So we don't have any money that's in some Carolina consortium pool. There are no Carolina consortium employees. You know, we're UNCG employees that are doing this as part of our service as faculty members. This is part of our service to the state and to the profession. And NC Live can sign a license for everybody, and pay a bill for everybody with their central funding and central staff. We can't do that. We just negotiate deals, send them out to the group and ask people if they want to do them. If they do them, yay. If they don't want to do them, yay. Don't, don't do them if you don't want to. It's all completely optional. Um, and whereas NC Live has had this very elaborate committee structure, of these representatives and Robert's rules of order and all that stuff, we've never had any committees, um, which is pretty much unheard of for any large organization in academia, right? I mean, we're, we're like built around committees, but we haven't been doing that. We just make decisions at an annual meeting of the whole, we invite all the membership, and then we'd ask, you know, the tough questions to the entire group. You know, what is the future of the organization? Are we, do we want to change our mission? And we used to ask everybody in the room and, you know, work it out by consensus of 100 people. It actually has worked pretty well. Last year, I did set up the first committee, um, partly because of the issues that NC Live was causing and uh, partly for some other reasons, which, which I'll mention soon. So we do actually have an advisory committee now uh, in Carolina Consortium for the first time. We do have the annual meeting the whole each May to make decisions. Uh, and the Carolina Consortium is unique in the country. There's no one else that's got an organization doing our volume of business with as many institutions that doesn't have, you know, six or 10 or 12 professional staff. We're doing this with part-time volunteers. So I think we're the most efficient organization in the country in that regard. And we, um, provide all kinds of different products. As I tell people sometimes, just partly tongue in cheek, you know, if we could all pool our money together and get a better deal on toilet paper, why wouldn't we do that? I mean, so why set restrictions on what you get? If you get more for the dollar by working together, kind of the sky's the limit, which is nice in theory. Of course, it's, there's a limited number of hours we all have to work on these kinds of things. And I don't want to organize the next big toilet paper deal. 
So let me give you an example of three deals, different kinds of content and different structures. So you can see the diversity. All of the Carolina Consortium deals follow different models. They have very different content and they're very different from one another. So an example of a big journal deal is our Springer deal. Um, so when UNCG got into this deal in 2005, we were paying 120,000 for 200 Springer subscriptions. Um, and when it became a CC deal by joining and getting other people in with us and putting all our money together to make a much, much larger amount of money that Springer would actually pay attention to, then all of us got subscriptions to all 1600 Springer journals for the same money we were already paying. So we were paying 120,000 for 200 way back then. That same money now gets us 1,600, but we're actually paying less than if we had just keep, kept subscribing to that 100, that those 200 all this time, because my deal has a lower inflation rate than if we just stuck with that smaller number of direct subscriptions. So we're actually paying less and getting way more under this deal. And that's true for all the other schools in the deal as well. An EBSCO database, uh, the way those are usually set up, you know, it depends which, which exact product, but it's like, you know, two to five sub subscribing institutions, you get a 5% discount, six to nine, you get a 10%, you know, it's, there's a scale. And with um, communication and mass media complete, you know, we're at the max of that scale. So we get the max discount of 30%. Uh, a data set, um, the Simmons local add-on for Simply Analytics. So that one's a whole different structure. Everybody who's a member of the Carolina Consortium gets, just gets a flat 10% discount. So you can see by looking at these three, we do very different types of products and each deal is different. They have a different discount structure and they work in different ways. And we have lots and lots of subscriptions um, through the Carolina Consortium, as you might imagine since we're running it. So to some extent, when there's a product that we want, that we think other libraries would want as well, it behooves us to approach the vendor and say, hey, could we get a special deal for the consortium? Um, and then we end up paying less as well. Not that it's self-serving. I mean, other people can do the same thing. Other, you know, Elon, you know, let me know a couple of months ago they had a product they wanted me to try to get a deal for because they wanted it. So uh, we do try to do deals that anyone suggests, but we do ones for ourselves as well. So lots of journals and those uh, 15 or so journal packages that are listed account for, I don't know, probably 8,000 or 9,000 journal subscriptions. So that's a lot of journals we're getting through those deals. Uh, if you look at the streaming, that's a really strong growth area. And most of our streaming stuff uh, particularly now we kind of ratcheted down canopy a bit, um, comes through the Carolina Consortium. And then, as I mentioned, we took on a lot of EBSCO databases when um, NC Live dropped them. We have had a long-term agreement with NC Live that when they drop something, the Carolina Consortium would pick it up. It's just because the whole state doesn't want to get something, a collective subscription through NC Live doesn't mean that 10 or 15 or 20 of us don't want to get together and have a joint subscription through the Carolina Consortium. So a lot of EBSCO databases. Um, and then there's some other content as well. So, you know, and as I mentioned, we are disproportionately supporting the Carolina Consortium in a way that's not fair and maybe other people should step up. But our annual cost avoidance is nearly $12 million. And the time that we put into it I mean, I don't get paid $12 million, right? This is only part of my job. So we are making more money out of this than we're putting into it. So it's okay <laughs> if we're doing a little more. Uh, opportunities for involvement with the Carolina Consortium. You know, we do have a listserv to send out information on deals. It's not really a discussion listserv to talk about issues. It's more a sending out information about uh, deals and meetings and so forth. Uh, we do have webinar series that are posted on the site, which you'll see there. Um, and if anybody's interested in, in working directly with the Carolina Consortium, we may have some opportunities for people to work on things if, if you uh, 
talk to one of the, the folks who's on that core group. Um, and, you know, thoughts on the Carolina Consortium and challenges and things. So <sighs> with the Carolina Consortium, each school is only going to get exactly what they need, right? You're not going to, you know, if I have a deal for a given product and you don't want it, don't get it. You would only get it if you thought it was a good deal and you actually needed it. So that's one of the advantages. Like with NC Live, we get stuff we don't need because it's stuff that will be okay with it. It's acceptable to everybody. And we get stuff that's great, don't get me wrong, but everybody's also getting stuff they don't need. This is really targeted. Um, also, another benefit is that we share cost and usage data. We're very transparent within the organization about who pays how much for which product, and we compare notes on things, which most groups don't do. So that's helpful. And obviously, since it's run by volunteers, there's no expensive overhead to maintain. So like you remember with uh, NC Live, they get 2.6 million and 700,000 of that goes to support their staff. That's a lot of overhead. That's a very high percentage of the amount that's allocated to the organization. But with our organization, 100% of the money that's spent on e-resources goes to e-resources. We're not taking overhead. Again, most organizations that are set up the way the Carolina Consortium is charge everybody. Either everybody has to pay $5,000 a year to be a member, or they pay 3% of, of every transaction gets skimmed off the top by the organization to pay for, for fees. Um, the CC is very flexible in membership. We don't have these like COIs and, oh, you're not a member of this COI, so you can't join us. I mean, hell, if somebody wants to join the Carolina Consortium, that's fine with me. As long as it's a library, they'll benefit and they appreciate it and are, are going to be cooperative and stuff. It, it doesn't matter to me who's a member. And flexible in terms of products, too. Again, we don't care what deals we do. Um, and we're not trying to, you know, say we're not going to do big deals or we're not going to do this. We're going to do, we're going to offer deals to people. And if they want to do them, they can do them. If they don't want to do them, they don't have to. This is individual schools get to decide. So there's a lot of benefits to the way the CC is set up. There's also some challenges because, you know, we don't have central staff. So we have to carve this out of time that could be spent on other things. Um, and then, you know, sustainability and succession planning is an issue because I'm not going to be, you know, I don't plan to work at UNCG till I drop dead in my office, right? I have other things I want to do in my life and I will be retiring at some point. So we need to plan for that. Um, the licensing is kind of a challenge since we don't have a central staff. I can't sign a license on behalf of everybody, which, you know, it's one thing that everybody signs their own license, but then everybody wants to get their lawyers involved and then that makes everything super complicated. Um, and the fact that we don't have all in deals that I don't do a deal that's just for every single school in the consortium means I can't get as good a deal. Right. So if I could do a deal for 200 schools, I would probably get a better discount than if I do a deal that only 20 schools do. Because the more the merrier, the bigger the number that participate, the better the deal. So there are some some challenges uh, for the consortium and. You know, we'll be talking more about the sustainability and succession planning over the next year or two. Um, well, any questions about the CC or our homegrown consortium? And it's always been CC centric. We've had, you know, the, the core membership group, you know, Beth was on it, Kate Hill, you know, so we've had some transition uh, within uh, the UNCG personnel, but it's always been extremely UNCG focused. So Lyricis uh, was one of the OCLC regionals. It used to be that you didn't really do business with OCLC. You did business with a regional who then worked with OCLC on your behalf. Uh, Lyricis was Solonet at that time. And so they became the Southern Library Network. So they were a when OCLC cut those groups loose, they reinvented themselves as a resource and service consortium. And we get quite a few subscriptions from them, not nearly as many as we get from NC Live or the Carolina Consortium, but we do get things from them. And we pay, I don't know, $4,000 a year or something like that to be members so that we can get these discounts. And obviously the discounts exceed 
the amount we're paying them or we wouldn't be doing it, all right? But it's a little bit different model than the CC because we do have to pay to be members. I don't really have a lot more to say about leaderships. I've not been as involved with them uh, as I have in, in the other ones. I've all I've been in leadership position in the other three. So how do we compare to other states in our kind of e local e-resource consortium? Um, you know, our state system is weird that, you know, <laughs> it's not very active. We've only got these three EBS deals and they're recent. And it's weird that, well, it's unusual. I mean, weird in a negative way. It's unusual that um, our flagship doesn't play a leading role. That's, that's not the way it usually is. Uh, NC Live was set up as this kind of level playing field where you get stuff for everybody, which sounds great, but it does mean we get stuff that doesn't necessarily, we don't really need at UNCG. And the public libraries get stuff that maybe UNCG wants that doesn't benefit them. And it kind of limits them in some ways that they're doing these all-in deals. Um, and then the CC, you know, we're doing these opt-in deals, which the state system's not doing and NC Life's not doing, and they both had a chance to do that. And if they had, then we wouldn't have to create the CC, but there was a void that needed filling. So we've got that a, kind of a third player, which is unusual. Usually you don't need three players to get the job done, but we did in this case. Um, and the CC is very, it's unique. There's nothing else like it in the country. So it's kind of hard to evaluate it and, and fit it in and compare it to other, other states. Nobody else has anything quite like it. Um, and because we're kind of doing things, we're split kind of three ways, we're not really you know, planning things as a state as well as some other folks are. Uh, we don't have a statewide shared collection development policy. If you look at a, like Pascal, my friend Rick Mall down, South Carolina runs Pascal. They've got like six employees, same as NC Live, six more than I've got in the Carolina Consortium, six more than ULAC's got, okay? He's running a statewide ILS. He's doing a statewide ILL delivery. He's got some deals that are all in. He's got some deals that are opt-in. And then he also, they're all involved in the Carolina Consortium deals too. But that's one organization that's doing a lot, wearing a lot of hats and doing a lot of different things and they're working on shared collection development, other things as a state, in a way we're not because we're kind of split up in different ways. All right, so that's my thoughts and hopefully I give you enough entertaining commentary and not just you know reeling through a bunch of numbers about how many databases we subscribe to or how much money we save. Any questions? There haven't been any questions in the chat, but I would encourage anyone to ask questions while we're here. I learned a lot of stuff. Rachel wants the details about the perfidy of NC Live, no doubt. I, I want the tea, all the tea, anyway. Well, I, I can tell you that a, a grant was submitted without my knowledge or consent that NC Live would take over the Carolina Consortium. Uh, and it made it sound like I knew all about it and people were told I knew all about it and agreed to prove to it. And that why does that, why does it, true. it sounds familiar. We've had other people submit grants with other people's names on them. Huh, okay. Yeah, we're being I was kind of put out by that. I was like, God darn it. That's the second LSTA grant that, that somebody else has put my organization's name on for them to get money off of after, I, you know, when they clearly knew I didn't want them to. Yes, it was Thanks. most personal. But it wasn't, it wasn't um, about me and him. It was, it was stuff that he was doing to the NC Live membership without their knowledge and consent and the way he was not keeping his own executive committee informed. And those people are my friends and colleagues because I was on that group for 15 years and I know them. So I just called them up and told them, hey, you know what your boy's doing? You might want to know. <laughs> All right, man. Sorry, I'm nosy. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Tim, what's the typical discount that we get through the Carolina Consortium, the negotiated discount? Uh, it's super variable. It's And some of them, it's really hard to... So some of them are percentage discounts, and that tends to be what the database is. 
So, you know, 10 percent, 15, 20, somewhere in there. And they are real discounts. They aren't just I mean, sometimes you get a discount, but they may raise the price up 20 percent to give you a 20 percent discount. But we know libraries that subscribe to these things, so we can go back and double check and see what we're really getting. So in the data in the databases, it tends to be in that range. Um, where it's hard is with like the EBS deals or the journal deals, because what's happening is you aren't necessarily paying less, but you get like 10 times as much, and that has a value to it. And also, if you're getting a lower inflation rate, then you are saving money over time. Every year, you're getting an extra discount built in along the way. Thanks. And it's very hard to compare consortium uh, discounts across consortiums and consortium deals because people tend not to share that information with one another. Hey, Tim, um, you had said that the CC is very UNCG strong in terms of our representation. With the succession, do you anticipate that being diminished in the future? Or do you think that will still say pretty UNCG driven or staffed or I don't, I don't know the word to use for that. But. Well, you know, if if one of the core negotiating team or somebody else really is dying to do that and has capacity, you know, we can talk about that. Um, my personal opinion is that it's time for, for it to move for the health of the organization and that mm -hmm. it shouldn't be at one place long term. Uh, I will just say that NC State has been our COI representative in NC Live since 1996 or whenever it started, and no one else has ever had a chance. And that's been part of the problem with NC Live. You know, if this is a membership group with lots of members, you know, we need to get other people involved and not be the center of it all forever. I think we kind of ran into that issue with NCSU and our other organization. So I'd like to see a transition, but you know, if there are folks here that want to step forward and do the work that I'm doing, um, are you volunteering, Dallas? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm certainly interested in that work um, and maybe, you know, participating or contributing in some way. I don't think it's set in the forefront, but do you anticipate that it would be picked up by like an assistant dean at another university or at a dean somewhere else to head it up? Or is it not really... Administrative so, role isn't really requisite. So the problem is I can do this in about 20% of my time mm -hmm. because I've been doing it for 18 years. And so I know a lot of stuff off the top of my head. I don't have to go digging around for it and finding it or anything. I'm, and I've got a workflow and I know how to do this stuff because I've been doing it. If I gave it to somebody else, it would be a full-time job. Right. I mean, it just would. I mean, over time, you might be able to get it down to a half-time job or a three-quarter time job. And nobody's going to volunteer to do that, I don't think. So we probably have to give it to an existing organization. Um, the NC Live would have been my choice. And if they have a different executive director, then, you know, uh, things might change. That would be good. You know, Pascal would be willing to do it. I've talked to some other existing consortia in other states. So I think there's, there's some options. But ultimately, uh, the plan is to take a slate of choices to the, the members and let them decide. So that's partly why I, I created this advisory committee, because I didn't want to be the one making a decision for them. Because once I'm gone, right. you know, why should it be up to me? You know, once I retire, it's, it's their <laughs> group. They need to decide. They need to move forward, you know. So I want that group to come up with, uh, you know, a list of two or three options with some pros and cons and, and you know, possible costs and things. Because there will probably be a cost going forward. It's free now to everybody. But once it becomes formalized in some group, they'll probably start charging two or 3% overhead. They'll probably have to sign an MOU or a membership document or something that they don't have to now and all that. Yeah. So it okay. could be very different. Okay, great, thanks. Sure. Okay, well, I've got a four o'clock, so I need to bail out. But thank you all for your attention yeah. today. If you have any other questions, please ask. You know where to find me.
Yeah, thank you, Tim. Um, I put the link to the ULVLC Lib Guide on there. That is where all the recordings live. Um, pay attention to the next dates. Um, we uh, have a lot of good ones coming up in February, a couple scheduled for March. If you have any ideas for ULVLC sessions, uh, please email Jenny or I. Um, any ideas, we welcome them all. Um, we have, again, great great people here. So have a great day, everyone. Um, see you soon. Bye.